Um, it's a huge issue. And Joe Biden has a bill uh, that he desperately wants the Republicans to pass so we can actually get some funding down uh, to, to shore up the, the southern border. But Republicans won't do that either. Yeah, there's a crisis at the border, and the CR that just passed doesn't include anything to do with the border, which has given the White House the upper hand to say, we want to fix the problem at the border, Republicans. Won't you help us? You professed to be so concerned about it. Let's get moving on it. So immigration, the surge of migrants at the southern border are going to be big factors in the 2024 presidential election. According to the New York Times, the current Republican frontrunner, former President Trump, plans to address immigration with mass deportations, detention camps, and a new Muslim ban if he is reelected. That's right, banning a religious group from coming to the United States. The Biden administration described Trump's reported plan as extreme, racist, and cruel. Meanwhile, our next guest says the debate over U.S. immigration policy is clouded by misinformation, and he is our good friend, former Treasury official, Morning Joe economic analyst, Steve Ratner at the Southwest Wall with his chart. Steve, good morning. So let's begin with the reality of what exactly is happening right now at the southern border. Yeah, Willie, there is an enormous amount of misinformation, and I got interested in this issue to try to figure it out. And so here's what I learned. Let's start at the southwestern border, the south border, where we've had this surge in encounters, but it's not quite what people think. So yeah, this is, this is a surge. You can see it's up to two and a half million people. But these are not people who snuck into the country, contrary to what many people may think. These are not people who snuck in the country. These are people who actually ended, in the ha ended up in the hands of Customs and Border Protection. These are people who we can call it apprehended, who are stopped from coming in the country and end up going into our immigration system, which I will explain. So if you come over here, uh, a colleague, uh, my colleague Eric Krebs and I put this together because it is so complicated, but let me just, I'm not going to go through it all, but let me just try to give you the takeaways, so to speak. So two and a half million people encountered, apprehended, whatever you want to call it, at the southern border. We think, the government thinks, that another 600,000 did successfully sneak in the country, swam across the Rio Grande, whatever they did. But the important point to know is that 80 percent of the people who tried to get across the southern border were actually apprehended, were actually in the hands of Customs and Border Protection. That's a pretty good percentage uh, of success, 80 percent in our hands. The problem is we have this unbelievably broken system, and I'm not going to go through all this, as I said, that puts people through all kinds of different uh, routes and channels and so on. But when the dust settled, what happened with those two and a half million people last year was that just under, a, uh, just under a million were sent back, deported, otherwise removed from the country. The rest of them go into this system of immigration courts, applications for asylum, applications for other kinds of humanitarian relief. But because the courts are so backlogged, and to uh, Joe's earlier point, because the government will not fully fund this because of the partisanship of it, two and a half million people, roughly 2.4 million people, stayed in the country they're in a system of trying to get asylum, trying to get humanitarian relief, or eventually getting deported, but they're here for now. And so this is really the problem with our system, that we cannot get these people processed, and so they sit here. And what is the problem? We're underfunded, as you said, and so there's been this huge increase in backlogs in the immigration course. Two and a half, this is that two and a half million people again, added to the backlog that I showed you over there, all the way up from less than 500,000 a few years ago. So we need to fund the immigration system, and we also need to reform it in a way where people can, can get much faster treatment of their requests to stay in the country or get deported. So, Steve, before you move on to your third chart, what all is going into that spike? It is a big spike that we're seeing on those charts behind you. Republicans say it's the weakness of Joe Biden that he's signaled that our borders are open, so come on up. But we should point out that President Obama, under President Obama, those numbers were very low. He was even called by Democrats the deporter in chief. And under Donald Trump, they did come back up. So would you look at the patterns? What goes into that? That's a great question, Willie, and I should have addressed it. Yeah, probably there are some people who heard the, uh, the president's softer message, President Biden's softer message at the beginning of his term about we're not going to build any more wall and we do a few other things. But the bulk of it, we think, is because economic conditions, to Joe's earlier point, 
are very strong here, and people know that. They want to come and get jobs. By contrast, economic conditions in Latin America had the worst recovery of, from COVID, much worse recovery from COVID, and so they're desperate. And then you have countries like Haiti, Nicaragua, Venezuela, that have become so strife-ridden, so difficult to live in, that people just want to leave. So it's a very complicated set of reasons, but I would again emphasize, these are not people who snuck in the country. These are people who actually got caught trying to enter the country or just tried to enter the country and ended up in our system under our control. 80% of the people who showed up at the southern border last year ended up in the hands of Customs and Border Protection. All right, so as we move to your third uh, chart there, Steve, what does it tell us about our population, about what immigration means to our workforce and, and the age of, our, of the people who live here? Yeah, so as I tried to say, we're not being overrun by immigrants, legal or otherwise, and that is actually a problem, and it's a problem for this reason. Our fertility rate, like most other major countries, is declining. Fewer babies per woman, a whole set of reasons for that. So if you look at our population projections, if we had no immigration in this country, our population would actually peak next year. And then it would start to decline all the way like that out to just over 200 million at the end of the century. We take in uh, roughly a million immigrants a year legally uh, now through various processes. That will hold our population at roughly flat. If we want our population to grow at the same rate that it grew at in the 20 years from 2000 to 2020, we need to take in 3 million immigrants a year. So there is a really strong argument for why we need more immigration, not less immigration. Now, let me just show you by contrast China. China does not really have any immigration. They actually have emigration, 300,000 people a year leaving. And so China's population has already peaked and, it's, and it could decline to as little as 770 million by the end of the century. So I think we want to look like this not like that, and you need immigration to do that. Now, for the past 30 years, the number of immigrants we take, the normal way, people who apply for visas from wherever they live and say, I want to come and live in America, or they're already here on some basis and they say, I want to get a green card and stay, has been basically flat at around a million. So we, even though our population has grown, even though the number of jobs that we have and the people we need to do those jobs has grown, we're not taking any more through the normal visa process than we were 30 years ago, and that's a mistake. And we should also point out that of the ones we do take, only 27% are coming here for a job-related reason, to provide a skill or a job service that we need. Others are coming for good reasons, 58% for family reunification and things like that are humanitarian. But we need people to come here and take the jobs uh, of the future that we're creating at the moment. A great look at a very complicated problem. Steve Ratner at the Southwest Wall with his chart. Steve, thanks so much.